Migration is such a huge topic that obviously you can't cover um, all or even uh, most of it uh, in uh, such a short period of time. So obviously anything I don't cover now, we'll obviously we'll have a long discussion uh, and Q&A uh, later. The debate about migration uh, is full of misconceptions. Both the arguments for uh, and uh, against it are often flawed and the nature of migration is often uh, misunderstood. So it's, not, it's perhaps not surprising then that immigration policy uh, is wrong-headed and that irrational fears often take precedence uh, over sober analysis. In a nutshell, the economic case for migration is this. In our globalizing world, where the economy is forever changing and where economic opportunities no longer stop at national borders, it is normal and desirable for people to move around to work, whether within Britain or internationally, whether they're British business people or Polish plumbers. A more mobile workforce makes the economy more flexible and that allows it to adapt more quickly to change and that improves growth and stability. <coughs> and last but not least, foreigners' diversity and dynamism boost competition, innovation and enterprise and that raises long-term growth and makes everyone in Britain, Britain better off. Now, it's widely accepted that Britain benefits from free trade, not just within the EU but also uh, around the world. And the benefits of migration are very similar uh, to those of trade. Because if you think about it, if we go abroad for surgery, then it's called trade. But if the foreign surgeons come here to operate on us, it's called migration. But in each case, we are buying medical services from abroad. It's the same economic transaction. But where services have to be delivered locally, like cleaning or construction, then migration is the only form of international trade that is possible. And thus often, it is often cheaper and mutually beneficial to import clothing from China or IT services from India. It often makes sense to import services that have to be delivered on the spot. And we accept that in the case of American business people. And surely the same logic, though, applies to Indian IT workers, to Congolese cleaners, uh, or to Brazilian bar staff. And if it doesn't, why not? Now, many people also argue that high-skilled migration is preferable to low-skilled migration. But that's a bit like saying that Britain benefits from importing American software, but not Chinese clothes. In fact, the benefits of migration depend largely on the extent to which newcomers' attributes, skills, perspectives, and experiences are different to our own and contribute uh, and complement ever-changing local needs and circumstances. Now, that, those kind of things could be, well, skills which are in short supply here in Britain, a willingness to do jobs that British people don't want to do, knowledge and contacts of a country with which we export, a propensity for hard work, or a different way of viewing problems and how to tackle them. So at the moment, Britain needs low-skilled, in inverted commas, foreign care workers to look after the sick and the elderly more than it does need high-skilled uh, American bankers. Now, the misconception that Britain only needs to, to high-skilled workers from outside the EU is compounded by an even more crazy notion, which is that somehow governments can pick and choose the right workers the economy needs. The Government's Migration Advisory Committee recently suggested that Britain should allow in veterinary surgeons, but not other veterinarians, chefs, but only if they're paid £8.10 an hour, and ballet dancers, but not choreographers or other dancers. It's absurd. There's no way the government can have the information to second-guess the employment needs of the huge, economy, huge uh, UK economy now or in future. Think how hard it is being the human resources manager of a big company. It's nonsense to think that anyone can do a job like that for a complex modern economy with tens of thousands of businesses. The 1970s and the, and the Soviet Union proved conclusively that manpower planning doesn't work. Now, longer term, this policy is even more absurd. If they'd been born, born abroad, we would have turned away a young Richard Branson or a young Alan Sugar because they don't have a university degree. Ditto Lewis Hamilton's grandparents or the Jewish immigrants who set up Tesco or Marks and Spencer. Immigration officials would have turned away a Kenyan goat herd called Barack Obama Sr. because clearly nothing great could ever come of him. And while it's impossible to predict 
which specific migrants Britain needs in future, let alone what the optimal rate of immigration should be, we can say some things. First of all, that a more open labour market is better than a more closed one, and that immigration policy should not arbitrarily discriminate between different types of worker, or indeed to set a total cap on how many are needed at any point in time. People and companies are best placed to make employment decisions. Now critics say, well yes, but we could do everything ourselves if we wanted to. And yes, that's true. You know, Robinson Crusoe scraped by alone on his island. But by closing off our options, it has a cost. Without immigrants, English strawberries would go unpicked, or they'd be so expensive that we would import Spanish ones instead, picked, of course, with foreign labour. And despite the fact that there were high wages on offer, for, for decades there was a shortage uh, of plumbers in this country, that, that is, until Polish ones arrived. So immigration controls make us worse off, and by raising the cost of goods and services, they harm the poor most of all. Now, our future prosperity depends on developing new high productivity activities and nurturing the ones that already exist. And it's vital that the companies that are based in Britain are able to tap the widest pool of talent available. But a large share of future employment will be in low-skill, low-productivity activities that are tied to a specific location. Things like preparing food, security guards, personal care. And that's because jobs like that cannot re readily be mechanised or outsourced. After all, you can't care for an elderly person using a robot or from overseas. And that's why you see that the fastest area of employment growth in Britain is not high-tech, it's care for the elderly. And that can only continue to rise. If you see the UN predicts that by 2050, the number of people aged over 80, those most likely to need care, is going to double to 8.7% of the population. And those people are going to need look, looking after. And yet retirement homes and local councils can't find suitable British applicants for care working vac vacancies. If we're going to attract British people to do those jobs, you'd have to pay much, much higher wages if people would rather be doing something else. And what would that mean? Well, it would mean either that pensioners would make do with less care, or there'd have to be budget cuts elsewhere, or there'd have to be huge tax rises. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is, who's going to look after us? when we're old. Well, because wages in Britain are so much higher than those in, say, the Philippines, there are many people in that country who'd be happy to do that kind of work. It's not exploitation because it makes everyone, taxpayers, migrants, British people young and old, better off. It doesn't undercut wages because British people don't want to do those jobs anyway. And it does not undermine social standards because legal migrants have recourse to unions and the law. And it doesn't entail creating a permanent underclass, because if migrants are temporary, as most aspire to be, then their point of reference is their home country, and they return home from their work in Britain much better off. Those that settle, their wages tend to rise over time as they gain skills, contacts, and experience. And their British-born children ought to have the same opportunities as other British children. If it turns out that some are left behind, whoever their parents are, then surely there is a reason to redouble our efforts uh, to ensure equality of opportunity, not to blame immigration. The second benefit of migration is that it makes the economy more flexible. Job shortages can be quickly met by migrant workers who are more willing, once arrived, to move to where the jobs are and to change jobs as the conditions change. How else would we have managed the massive increase in doctors and nurses over the past decade? How else would the 2012 Olympics uh, be ready on time? And that flexibility allows the economy to go faster for longer without sparking inflation. And that leads to higher living standards for every British person, lower employment and lower interest rates than otherwise. And now that the recession is biting and the pound is falling, many Polish people are going home. And thanks to Britain's open door policy, unemployment will rise less than otherwise. And that means the, the recession will be shorter and shallower than otherwise and the public finances uh, will have less of a strain. The biggest benefit, though, is greater diversity and dynamism. We hear all this abuse about migrants, but actually, they're a self-selected minority. They tend to be young, hard-working, and enterprising. Because like starting a new business, migrating is a risky enterprise, 
and hard work is needed to make it pay off. And bringing in young industrial types not only boosts the productivity of the economy directly, it also tends to make local workers more productive. So you see, for example, the Polish builders may spur their British counterparts to up to their game, and as well as transferring new skills to them. In the longer term, immigration is vital in stimulating the innovation and enterprise on which our future prosperity depends. You have to just see that history and global experience show that the exceptional individuals who come up with the brilliant new ideas often happen to be migrants. Instead of following the conventional wisdom, they tend to see things differently. And as outsiders, they're more determined to succeed. That's why 70 of America's 300 Nobel laureates were born abroad, and so are 22 of Britain's 114. And migrants' diverse, collective diversity is also vital, because nowadays most innovation comes from people, groups of people sparking off each other. So if you think about it, if there are 10 people in a room trying to come up to, with a solution to a problem, and those 10 people all think alike, then no matter how brilliant they are, those 10 heads are no better than one. But if they all think differently, then by sparking off each other, they can come up with pro solutions to problems faster and better. And there's a whole wealth of research that shows that. You just have to look at Silicon Valley, where Google, Yahoo, eBay were all co-founded by immigrants who arrived not <coughs> selected by some clever point system, uh, but as children. Philippe, yeah. Now, those benefits are substantial, and they provide the means to, to compensate any losers, offset any social costs, and still leave Britons better off. Because the extra tax revenue and the higher economic growth, for example, helps pay for better healthcare, education, and better transport.